So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lindsay Humphreys and I'm the Program Director for Junior Achievement of New Mexico. Thank you for attending our virtual career speaker series. This program is open to JA students across New Mexico and we highlight business professionals, entrepreneurs, and innovative thinkers from a variety of industries. Each featured speaker will share details about their education, their job, and their career journey. But before we get started, just a few virtual meeting etiquette reminders. As you all know, this meeting will be recorded and posted onto our YouTube channel for anyone who was unable to attend. So feel free to send that link to anyone in your network when it comes to you. At this time, if you could all take a second and please type your first and last name into the chat box. It's in the top right hand corner. It's the dialogue box. That'll just help help us keep track of who is here today. And if you're an educator and you're on the call with your students, if you could also just type in the number of students that are participating with you. During the speaker's presentation, I wanna make sure that you all have your mics muted. And if you have questions during the presentation, you can type them into the chat box or you can just write them down and you can unmute when the time comes. So today we are so excited to welcome Tim Lyons. Tim is the Species Survival Officer for Aquatics at the New Mexico Biopark Society and a dear, dear friend of mine. So Tim, I'm gonna share your PowerPoint and the floor is yours. Thanks for that, Lindsay. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in today. I'm really excited to talk to you and uh, I really hope that you have some questions for me at the end of the presentation. And I hope that you can take a lot away from this. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in as soon as my slides are up. Uh, so like Lindsay said, I am a species survival officer at the New Mexico Biopark Society. You can go ahead and jump on the next slide. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the biopark, but maybe not all of you. Uh, so the biopark is a zoo, an aquarium, and also a botanical garden, all kind of under the same roof. Uh, so we have a lot of really unique opportunities to work with plants, animals, fish, uh, you name it. Um, so I'm a species survival officer there, and we'll come back to what I actually do and what that actually means a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but first I wanna start with the journey. Um, so buckle up for a bit of a bumpy ride, and uh, Lindsay, go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so uh, The Economist recently did a, a really great write-up on the benefits of lifelong learning in any professional field. This, just, this doesn't just apply to the zoo world or conservation or science, it's for really any professional field. <clears throat> and if there's one message that I would encourage you to take away from this presentation, it's to continue to be curious about the environment around you. Um, curiosity is a character trait that encourages learning and <laughs> Learning is not difficult to do. You don't have to be a genius to learn. Uh, and in fact, dogs learn. When you see them scratching at the door, uh, that's them learning that if they scratch at the door, you'll let them outside. Uh, cats learn. If you have a cat that has ever knocked a glass of water off the countertop, that's the cat learning to get your attention by doing something that you don't like. Um, and even fish learn. If you've ever owned a pet fish, you know that Maybe a week after you start feeding it, it'll come up to the front of the glass to greet you because it knows that you are its primary source of food. Uh, so learning is inherent in, in all animals. Uh, and science is simply observing what's around you and systematically approaching a principle that you're curious about. So science is objective learning. <clears throat> and curiosity and learning have been so critical in my professional development that I, I wanted to mention them right at the outset of this presentation uh, because it, it really does kind of thread through the rest of what I'm gonna be talking about, uh, so please. Next slide, Lindsay, thanks. Uh, okay, so a little bit about where I started. I grew up in Miami, Florida. Uh, if you're not familiar with Miami, it's right at the very tip of Florida. Um, basically falling off into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but it's a concrete jungle, as you can see from the picture, uh, and it doesn't have a whole lot of connections to natural landscapes. Uh, this is contrasted quite a bit to, the, to Albuquerque in general, because you know we've got all these mountains around us and we've got all this desert and 
uh, river habitat. Um, Miami really doesn't have that. Uh, and I want you to notice in this picture how how little green there is. Uh, sure, there's a couple a couple little spots, public parks and stuff where you might be able to walk your dog. But in general, it's it's sky rises and um, and apartment complexes and parking lots. Um, Florida is also arguably one of the only places that is weird enough to give Albuquerque a run for its money. So growing up there was a little strange. Uh, people really like practical jokes that involve alligators. Um, some people have even thrown alligators through fast food drive throughs So it's a, it's a bit of a nutty place. Um, and so you and I have that in common. I can imagine that Albuquerque is kind of a, kind of a strange place to grow up in, and Miami was certainly that for me. Uh, next slide, please. But Florida does have one redeeming quality. Uh, and that's its connection to marine environments. And it's really the only place in the United States where coral reefs exist. Uh, so it's here where the concrete abruptly stops. And you can see that in the image, you see all kinds of urban sprawl, and then it just kind of stops. Uh, and that's where my natural classroom was growing up. Next slide, please. So my father was a fisherman and naturally I learned the tools of that trade early on. Uh, the difference between he and I is that he was interested in eating the fish. Uh, so that was his primary objective for fishing. My primary objective was to get close enough to actually observe the fish. I didn't really even like fish. Um, so any opportunity to get close to them was was a win in my book. And if, if you've never seen a, a fish close up, there are so many intricacies in the smallest fish from the eyes uh, the lenses, its scales, its teeth, its fins, and on and on and on. So that always just, uh, it always just astounded me how different each species was and anything I could do as a kid to, to, uh, to get my hands on a fish and really look at it. Um, that was, that was my primary objective. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, but my curiosity didn't extend only to aquatic organisms. So uh, pretty much any opportunity I had to interface with the natural world uh, was another opportunity to learn about it. So whether or not that was um, grabbing alligators in the Everglades, um, hanging out with the pot pig that I grew up with, or chasing invasive lizards around the yard, um, there's always an opportunity for anybody right around them to learn uh, and to understand their environment. Next slide, please. When I was an early teen, I realized that there was a much easier, less intrusive way to interact with marine ecosystems uh, compared to the fishing trips that I'd taken with my father uh, when I was younger. And that re revelation came in the form of scuba diving for me. So if you're not familiar with scuba, it's uh, this apparatus that I'm wearing in these pictures that allows you to breathe underwater for a certain amount of time. Um, and anyone's first experience breathing underwater is a mixed bag of fear, excitement, and disbelief. Uh, but it was in this exact moment that solidified my decision to uh, kind of turn my, my non-professional curiosity about the natural world into a profession. Next slide, please. So after high school, I was fortunate enough to attend the University of Florida to further my learning interests uh, more formally in marine biology. Next slide, please. And I'd also like to make it really clear uh, that a formal education is important, but an informal education based on your own interests, uh, you know, whatever it is, is, is just as important, if not more so, to your professional development in the early parts of your life. Uh, so for me, this came in the form of aquarium keeping. And this is something that I started doing when I was really pretty young uh, with freshwater fish. And then it kind of evolved into uh, saltwater fish, keeping live coral, growing coral, and then finally aquaculturing coral to the point that I was actually paying rent sometimes off of the amount of coral that I was growing. Um, so the aquarium keeping hobby is extremely unique in that it's a crossroads between all of these different fields of learning that all of you are learning right now, uh, from biology, chemistry, botany, physics and mathematics, 
engineering, construction, and even plumbing. Uh, so there's a lot to learn with this hobby, and and I'm always astounded at, at uh, just how much it has to teach. Next slide, please. And to further that point, I, I really wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today if I had not taken uh, personal growth and fulfillment in my own interests seriously from an early age. So regardless of what you're interested in, I guarantee that you'll end up taking away some, some valuable lessons that will serve you well in your profession uh, with, with what you do in your hobbies and in your spare time, even if it's, if it's video games. Um, that's phenomenal hand-eye coordination. And at the end of the day, you may become a really successful computer programmer and you may uh, make the next best video game hit that every kid is playing, like Fortnite, right? Um, so for me, it wasn't video games. Obviously, it was aquarium keeping and doing anything that I could to, to get more involved in, in the natural world. Uh, but it was skills like growing algae to raise young fish. So this is actually what my, what my college laundry room looked like. Uh, not typically what you would see if you walked into a college kid's laundry room. More likely you would just see a big pile of laundry. Um, and this is what my closet looked like in high school. Uh, it was filled with poison dart frog tanks. Um, and I learned how to breed them very well from an early age. And that was something that always freaked people out when they came over. <clears throat> and finally, on this slide, remember that technical, when somebody says a technical skill, uh, it's a bit of a subjective term. All it refers to is something that you've learned because you've made an attempt to learn it. it. It doesn't mean that it's hard and it doesn't mean that it's complicated. It just means that it's something unique that you're interested in and for that reason you've learned the skill. Next slide, please. And again, I don't wanna discount the importance of a formal education because there are a lot of things that are learned best under close supervision. Uh, in my case, I'm talking about things like technical diving, uh, reaching areas underwater that may be 200 feet or more deep, uh, may be in a cave 200 feet underwater, <laughs> uh, or may require some specialized equipment to you know, protect you from environmental hazards. Those are things that uh, really should be taught in a formal education or you might hurt yourself. And there's other stuff that's not dangerous that should be taught in a formal education too like basic mathematics and uh, basic biology and things like that. But when you begin to, when you begin to take that, that education that, that you've gotten formally and apply it to things that you're interested in, that's where the real magic happens. Next slide, please. And so because we live in the high desert and in the interest of instilling in all of you uh, the same wonder for the underwater world that you may not be as familiar with, uh, here are just a quick few pictures that I've taken over the years. Uh, this first one is actually a giant clam that is uh, phosphorescent, so it's it's uh, luminescent under blue light. Next slide, please. This next one is just a really pretty uh, acan coral. Next slide. Uh, here's another coral. This this type of coral is called euphilia. Next slide. And uh, finally a uh, a nice bright pink and blue fovea. Next slide, please. Okay, and now that we just got some really cool pictures out of the way, this might be the most boring slide in the presentation. Uh, but it's one that I'm most proud of because it represents my scientific achievements to date. Uh, it really reflects what an attitude of lifelong learning can do for your career. I'm 25 years old and, and I've I've had the fortune of going to college and getting a uh, a graduate degree and all of this stuff, but again, I want to come back to the fact that lifelong learning is really, really important for all of you. Um, and if you continue to challenge yourself, and if you continue to stay interested in your surroundings, I think you will quickly find that you're the one doing the teaching. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to move into uh, what I actually do at the biopark a little bit more. And it's no secret that animal biodiversity around the world is declining at a rate that humans have never seen before. Um, and this should set off warning alarms for every single person listening to this presentation. 
uh, because it's an issue that all of us are going to have to deal with in the near future. Um, and it's up to us, really, honestly and truly, each and every one of us, to prevent the loss of the natural world, because without them, there is no us. Um, we consistently think that we're above our environment and that could not be further from the truth. Next slide, please. And so my skill set has uniquely positioned me to do just that. And so in 2018, I was hired by the Albuquerque Biopark to take part in one of four biodiversity conservation hubs around the world. And the ultimate goal is to have one of these hubs on every continent. And we're, we're getting close to that. Um, but for the meantime, we're the big four. Um, and so we're, the Biopark has entered into a partnership with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is IUCN for short. Uh, and, and the IUCN is responsible for maintaining the red list of threatened species. So if you've ever heard uh, somebody say, oh, this species is endangered, or this species is critically endangered, or God forbid, this species is, is extinct, uh, that's the IUCN that makes that, de that designation ultimately. So it's this huge international consortium of, of scientists that uh, come together and figure out what species are most threatened, and then actually do something about it. Next slide, please. So the overarching goal of my position is pretty simple. Uh, it's figure out what species are most at risk of going ex extinct, and then put plans into action to prevent their extinction. Uh, so the process operates a lot like, like an emergency room would. Uh, some people who come into the emergency room might need treatment much more quickly than others. So for example, if say somebody walks up to the counter and explains that they need uh, a couple stitches for a cut on their finger, while at the same time, somebody who isn't breathing is being rushed in by an ambulance on a stretcher, uh, the person who isn't breathing would most likely be treated first. And this is a concept that we, that we call triage. Uh, so in the same way, we triage species and, and biodiversity. Um, and this is important because we need to prioritize which species these. All right, so the conclusions that we draw by assessing extinction risk, um, they're extremely useful in setting up policies to protect those species. Uh, this could be the development of a new protected area, for example, that includes most of the species range. Uh, or it could be something like fishing regulations that prevent uh, a certain fish from being over harvested for food. Um, and this is a good example. So this is a map of Mexico. Um, and Baird's tapir is a really large mammal that that has been hunted historically, and so it's not doing too great. But the red list and the red list process allows us to understand where the species still exists, and then design our our protected areas in a fashion that is most uh, most suitable to protect that species. Next slide, please. <laughs> this is my favorite slide. And finally, I want to address uh, the roles that zoos and aquariums play in species conservation. And this picture might be familiar to some of you. To a lot of you, I, I don't think that you'll know what it is uh, because it was well before your time and my time. <laughs> but uh, this is the last picture of a Tasmanian tiger in captivity before the species was declared extinct in the 1930s due to human hunting. Uh, so. In effect, we doomed this animal because it would occasionally get into a chicken coop and tear up somebody's poultry. Um, so this is historically what zoos looked like. Uh, modern day zoos are very, very different from what you traditionally think of when you when you look at black and white pictures of you know animals behind a chain link fence uh, standing on concrete. Um, the importance of zoos and aquariums today is that they serve a, critical, a very, very critical function. They're windows into an environment that you may never be able to see in person. Uh, and in a concrete jungle like Miami, uh, they may be a young person's only link to the natural world. And that was kind of the case for me, aside from um, the Florida Keys and, and scuba diving. Uh, so I understood that from a young age that aquariums and zoos are really influential in, in how a young person thinks and how a young person is exposed to the natural world. Uh, zoos and aquariums are also 
at the forefront of animal welfare. So we're constantly designing our exhibits for the benefit of the animals that we do have in captivity. Um, and we support conservation initiatives through captive breeding of those populations and on the ground habitat restoration. And finally, by supporting positions like mine. Uh, and quite honestly, without zoos and aquariums, nobody would be leading the charge on conservation issues. Um, so I, for one, am extremely glad that they exist. And, and I think you should be too. Next slide, please. And one final thing that I wanna mention is the importance of collaboration. If you can manage to learn about your environment from others with really diverse skill sets and life perspectives that you might not have, uh, it'll be an extremely rewarding experience. Um, and more to the point, if you can have a respectful discussion with a peer or with a, with a classmate over a topic of conversation that you may not necessarily agree on, I guarantee you that you will inherit that same level of respect. Next slide, please. And finally, in closing, um, I'll just say that there, there are a lot of perks to my job. Um, the first of which is occasionally eating in front of a giant shark tank like an evil villain. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of other perks too. Next slide, please. Uh, I get to travel to a lot of cool, unique places like Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. And uh, places like the, the Royal Gardens of England. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, maybe most importantly, I get to have some of the most meaningful interactions with some of the coolest animals uh, from sharks to snow leopards to lemurs and rhinos. Uh, but most importantly, I get to continue learning. Um, and I'm going to bring it back to that finally towards the end here. Uh, and I get to interact with a really diverse set of colleagues and scientists uh, that continue to teach me through collaboration. So no matter where your professional life takes you, uh, be curious, continue to learn, uh, treat each other with mutual respect. Those are my three biggest things that I've taken forward into my career. And those are the things that I think are, are most important. So um, I'm gonna leave you with, uh, with a bit of a kitschy uh, quote, which um, <laughs> I, don't know if it, I don't know if quotes are the way to go, but I'm just gonna leave you with one. And Socrates said this, and he said that education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. In other words, what interests you most, uh, find it and let your curiosity drive active learning in both your non-professional life and also in your professional life. If you spend all of your time in education, learning facts and statistics and formulas, um, not only will you, will you not see the value in learning, uh, you, you may not apply it to something that ultimately makes you happy. And that's the most important thing, I think. Um, next slide, please. So I'll leave it there. Um, and this is kind of my question slide because I really love it. A local artist actually, actually drew this for me and my colleagues based off of uh, some of the species that we've worked with. So there's a, a Mesa Verde cactus, uh, some fish, uh, one of which is the silvery minnow here in the Rio Grande, but also some from Mexico, uh, fireflies, which we're actively working on, and then a number of uh, medicinal plant species. Uh, so with that, I'll I'll turn it back over to Lindsay, and uh, I hope you all have some questions for me. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you all so much for taking the time today, and thank you, Tim, for your excellent presentation. We are going to open it up to questions if anyone would like to unmute. We do have a couple questions that were submitted uh, before registration or during registration, so I can start us off with one of those questions, and then we will get started with the open portion. So the first question that I'll ask is were you inspired by someone or something to do your job and did anyone ever tell you you couldn't do it hmm. okay so <laughs> um academia is a is a challenging field sometimes in that uh, a lot of people get so entrained in scientific thought and scientific thinking that it becomes kind of a kind of a an inclusive club and that's really how, how, not how it should be. So 
I've had professors in the past that have dissuaded me from this or that, um, but I haven't really had anybody, you know, staunchly oppose uh, any any career choice that I've made, really. Uh, and, it, and it comes down to what what you want to do for yourself, ultimately. People will tell you one thing or another, but it's up to you to make the ultimate decision. Um, and the second part of that question, <laughs> people that have inspired me, there have been a lot of them. Most of them are are dead now, um, but Jacques Cousteau was was a really important person early on in my in my inspiration. Uh, and Jacques Cousteau actually invented scuba, so he enabled all the crazy fish nerds like me to actually get into the water and uh, see fish in their in their own environment, which is just awesome. Uh, but but there's a lot of naturalists, brilliant naturalists that have come before us, and all of them have always inspired me. Um, you know, they go on these crazy adventures to lands unknown and come back with 500 new species that, that are new to science that nobody has ever seen. Those are the stories that, that always inspired me to, to uh, become a marine biologist. Thank you. Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question before I keep going? Nancy? Um, what was the favorite, what was your favorite animal you worked with? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I worked with a lot of really cool animals and I can't say for sure that I have a favorite, but I will say that the lemurs at the zoo are very pesky, funny little critters. And I, ha I have a lot of fun spending time with them. If you pull your phone out while you're with them, they'll try to snatch it from you. Uh, they'll also try to pull your watch off. Uh, they'll bite your shoes. Um, so they're they're pretty fun critters, and and I've always liked primates in general, especially lemurs, because I I don't know if if you're familiar with lemurs, but they exist only on a single island off the coast of Africa called Madagascar. Um, so it's a really really unique group of primates that has uh, that has kind of been isolated there, and you can't find them anywhere else in the world, so they're just super cool animals. Thank you, Nancy. Anthony, I saw your hand up, go ahead. Okay, um, is an aquatic animal considered like an animal that can like stand or water for a certain amount of time? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, it's kind of a loose definition. Uh, when I'm talking about aquatic animals, I, I typically, I, I'm typically referring to any organism that that occurs in an aquatic habitat. So that could be fish. Uh, in the case of mammals, it could be manatees or platypuses. Um, it could also be frogs. It could be turtles. Uh, it could be, you know, snakes that typically occur in the water. Like there's a a group of sea snakes called crates, and they spend most of their life on coral reefs. Uh, so snakes can be aquatic organisms too. Um, I would say anything that relies heavily on a primarily aquatic habitat. So that could still include things that come out of the water like alligators, right? They come out of the water to, to bask in the sun on the shore, uh, but they still need that aquatic habitat to survive. Thank you, Anthony. David, I see your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Um, what, uh, what do you think uh, started your uh, fascination for studying fish? Hmm. I think, I think it must have just been exposure at, a, at an early age to the marine environment. Um, it could have been anything else. And quite honestly, I'm an aquatic specialist because aquatic habitats are those that are most threatened in the world. Uh, because we we rely on them for so many things, right? You know, we we dam up rivers and we uh, pull fish and other organisms out of the water to consume, and we rely on water for drinking, and we rely on water to uh, disperse sewage and waste from cities and all of this stuff. Um, so, aquatic habitat is really some of the most threatened habitat on Earth. But I will say that. I could very easily be excited about just about any group of animals on the planet, honestly, uh, because they're they're all unique and they all come with their own distinct challenges as far as conservation is concerned. Um, but 
fish in general and uh, you know coral and stuff like that. That's just what I was exposed to at an early age, and and the thing that I feel like I'm I'm uh, a specialist in. Miss Pina, did you have a question? Yes, so I noticed your research focused on lionfish, and from what I know about lionfish, they are an invasive species. Mm, yeah. um, that's really the little bit that I know. What made you choose your research, and what was it specifically? Uh, so my graduate research did focus on lionfish, uh, and specifically on how the impact of the ornamental fish hobby, which you guys already know I'm really excited about too. I'm an active hobbyist, so I've actually brought some of these fish into my own aquariums. And um, it's funny, the, the ornamental hobby is a really, really great way to educate and to bring about a new generation of conservationists. But once in a while, uh, you also have hobbyists that are not very responsible. So in the case of the lionfish invasion, uh, that that really started because uh, a hobbyist dumped some of the fish from their aquarium that they didn't want anymore into the ocean in South Florida. And it created this massive species invasion where lionfish are now distributed from uh, southern Brazil in South America all the way up to New York State. Um, so they're really, really widely distributed and they eat native reef fish and they cause all these problems. And it was the result of a single person's action. So <laughs> this is a, a bit of an aside, but when you think about climate change and uh, species extinctions and all of this crazy stuff, and you think that your actions might not matter, they do. Uh, they could matter for the better or they could matter for, for the worse. And in this aquarist's case, it was very, very for the worst. Um, you know, it was a major detriment. And so I looked at, I looked at what the likelihood of other species of lion, lionfish being introduced into the marine environment was as a result of the aquarium trade existing. And I also did a little bit of work on, on some of the impacts that lionfish were having on our reefs. Um, but I picked invasion ecology specifically, and invasion ecology is the study of how an invasive species interacts with a native environment once it's introduced into that place. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in invasion ecology because it's, it's kind of a unique human-induced problem uh, that nature has never had to deal with before, quite frankly. So <laughs> when you put a fish in a new environment and none of the other native fish in that environment know what it is or know that it's venomous or know that it'll eat them, um, that's a unique place to test uh, science and ecological principles and, and some of those more underlying theoretical ideas behind uh, how different species interact with one another. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question in the chat that we're gonna ask really quick. One of the students on the call wants to know if you have ever touched a tiger. Hmm. No, I don't think that I've ever touched a tiger. I hope I get to at some point, um, but I do wanna, I do want to point out the fact that, you know, sometimes interactions with other species aren't, aren't always a good thing. Um, so typically when I've been exposed to, to cool things like snow leopards and rhinos and stuff like that, it's because there's a, a conservation purpose behind it, you know, where uh, we may be doing a health checkup on that animal to make sure that it's healthy. Um, uh, but, it, but it can be dangerous and um, it's important to be aware of the fact. I would love to touch a tiger, uh, but I don't know if I would be comfortable getting in an enclosure with a with a full grown tiger. That seems a little scary to me. <laughs> All right, so we have we are a little over on time, but I know that there's some more questions being asked. Um, there's one of the questions that just popped up in the chat. Have you ever worked with um, specifically endangered animals? Uh, yeah, I have. So um, there's a lot of them at the biopark. Um, and we've brought in a number of fish populations that we're we're actively raising and growing and the ultimate goal is to use those fish to reintroduce them to the environment that they once existed in um, so we we've got about 10 species of freshwater fish 
uh, on site at the biopark that are either endangered, critically endangered, or extinct in the wild. Excellent. And I'll I'll finish it up with Christian. Christian, you will be our final question. Is there any animal that you hope someday to interact with? An animal someday that I hope to interact with. Um, I will say that one animal that I haven't seen in the wild yet is a whale shark. And I would love to dive with a whale shark uh, because they are the biggest fish on our planet and they're beautiful creatures. And they're also gentle giants. They, they don't eat meat like other sharks. They eat uh, plankton and krill and really small animals. So that's, that's one thing that I really look forward to diving with at some point in the future. Thank you all so much for your questions. I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you, Tim, for your honesty and for answering the kiddos' questions on the call. So Absolutely. thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope that when you are finished with this presentation, you will all fill out our survey that tells us how we liked the program. And it also gives you a chance to win a Dion's gift card. So you want to fill out that survey so that you get a chance. I know Nancy's on the call. She won a couple weeks ago a gift card. So make sure you fill out the survey. Um, we partnered with Dion's to give a couple lucky survey responders um, a gift cards. So thank you all for doing that and being ready to do that in the future. Um, and then next week is National Chemistry Week. And so we will be featuring another one of my dear friends. And he will be on the call. He is a chemist at... Sandia National Labs, and his name is Rico Treadwell. So he will be on the call next week. So thank you all so much for joining us, Tim. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And kiddos, thanks for being on the call, and I hope I see you all next week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. It's good chatting with you. Bye. That was awesome. I love that. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. No problem.